the day that you have made and we rejoice and we are glad in it. Can we just celebrate the King of Glory, the Prince of Hallelujah. Peace, the Ancient of Amen. Days, our friend, our lover, the owner of our lives. Yes, you can celebrate him a bit more if you are watching online in the comments. Please let your King be glorified with your applause and just let him feel your love tonight. Amen. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're watching us from, and you're most welcome to this week's edition of Recharge. Yes, that's the energy, that's the spirit of Recharge. We're excited, we're looking forward to tonight, and we're trusting God for an encounter in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to especially welcome all those who are watching online, a very special audience online. Thank you very much for joining us again tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We encourage you to share in the comments where you're watching you know, us from and just to say hello to the person online as well as you. There's such a vibrant community online and it's always so good sometimes to communicate there. So please, you know, make a friend, say hello and let's build family and friends and relationships there. Of course, I'm not alone. Um, my name is Ayomaira Esse, by the way, and I'm not alone. As always, we have a full team here on stage for tonight's edition. Tonight is the second part of the look, our look at the Esther series, looking at our relationship with the king. Last week, we looked at the king as a sovereign king. We looked at the sovereignty of the king. And this week, we're switching gears to look at the lady and her lover. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, you can, you can celebrate that. Yes, please. The lady and her lover. I know there's something beautiful about love that you just come expectant, you know, feeling all good. But I bet you that tonight is going to be one that would, by the grace of God, transform your lives in Jesus' mighty name. So let me start by going to the far left. You know him. He needs no introductions. It's the one and only Pastor Dele Balogun Pidel. Amen. All right, so PDL is going to be. So tonight is extra special. Can you? Uh, hallelujah. Absolutely. So uh -huh. good evening. So let's try again. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. Um, yes, it's going to be an awesome evening. And uh, we are all looking forward to it, most especially me. I think we're going to battle that. Um, I'm going to compete. I'm going to compete, going to compete for that, for that, for that title. We're not sure yet who is the most expectant tonight. And of course, you know, talking about needing no introductions, we have our resident pastor. We like to call him Pastor Doctor Jude Woko. <laughs> pastor, you know, I'm very good at this. Ask Pastor Mildred. <laughs> so don't start what you can't finish. Good evening. I think the, 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 the trophy of who's the most excited about tonight will come to me. You will soon see why. All right. It's good to be here. It's good to have those of us on site and especially our friends online. Thank you for making it a date. Tonight I'm trusting God that you will look back and you say, what a way to spend and our 30 minutes in God's presence. And I'm trusting the spirit of God that he will deliver on his promise about the experience Amen. with God tonight. God bless Amen. you. Amen. Thank you so much, P. Jude. I was so expectant. By the way, if you're online, you want to type just on a scale of 1 to 100 how expectant you are. That'd be really great. And so talking about our very special guest for yes. tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait. Let me allow me to introduce. Let me introduce. Okay. So when we were thinking of, you know, our guest tonight is a woman of many parts so many parts you know some people know this angle and she's just a reflection of her father because our father is a lion he's the lamb he's the alpha he's the omega you know different dimensions and she expresses that so beautifully so she's a pastor many of us know her as that she's an author she's a blogger some of us might know that she's a sought-after speaker and preacher 
Very often for her wise counsels when it comes to relationship, love, and marriage matters. But beyond that, a depth and a fountain of wisdom by the grace of God. She has a number of ministries under her belt by the grace of God. She has Just Us Girls Global. She has Hannah's Heart Global. She's got also under that 3 p.m. with p.m. Some of us know that. She's a lover of God. The wife of one man. Pastor Kingsley Okonkwo, a.k.a. PK. Yes, sir. The mother of three mighty nations whom we love. She's the one and only Pastor Mildred Okonkwo, a.k.a. PM. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. And for me, like I told them, this is homecoming. Um, it's just good to be back home. It is good to Welcome be back home. Welcome home, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, so this present house is the home for all. You know, this is home. Pastor M said when she walked in here that there's a smell and a fragrance at this present house. And we know that by the grace of God. You know, we're not trying to brag or anything, but we brag on God. Hallelujah. And so for anyone who doesn't have a home, this is a good point to just mention that you can make this present house your home by the grace of God. Okay, so last week we started off with the, you know, with looking at Esther and the king. King Zexus. Some um, versions of the Bible refer to him as Ahasuerus. I'm sure by now, after how many weeks, we all know all the names and versions of his title <laughs> by the grace of God. But it would be great to just have a bit of a sense of what our conversation was around last week. And maybe I'll start with P. Dell to just share with us, you know, what, what was one take home for you last week with looking at the sovereignty of the king? Well, last week was quite uh, insightful. I mean, the whole of the Esther series has actually been, we were talking about it earlier this evening, and it's been quite mind-blowing. It's been, it's been, there was, there's been so much to unpack. You know, you, we have expectations, but uh, our expectations have really been surpassed in every, every way, shape, um, or form. Uh, so last week in talking about uh, Esther and, and the king, and in this case, the king being her lord, it was quite... Um, eye-opening for me because like I like I like to say in these kind of discussions I like to you know locate myself in this story because that way I can then personalize and be able to move so it's it's really much about our relationship with God and how do we interact with him how did how did how did Esther interact with the king as her lord you know, so we we're looking at that aspect last week. It was amazing. And what I like to say is that instead of going into too much detail, we don't have that much time tonight, I will say to everybody who wasn't here or who hasn't seen it, go to the YouTube channel, watch it. There's a lot to learn, much more than I can say in a few seconds. So that's my that's that's how I would describe last week. Absolutely. Thank you so much, P. Dell. We have so many things to talk about tonight that we want to move straight into the conversation. But like P. Dell has mentioned, please, if you haven't watched, beyond last week, all the episodes in this series and all the series prior, you can go onto our YouTube channel, TPH Media, and catch up, catch up, catch up. So let's go straight into today's theme, today's conversation. Esther, the, the lady and her lover. Right. You know, one, one, one dimension or expression of God that I love very much is that God is love. It says in 1 John 4 verse 8. So the definition, the expression, the person of God is love. And so today is a God day. But I'd like to speak to, you know, just ask P. Jude to share with us when we look at the relationship between Esther and the king. It's a very sweet and beautiful romantic story in the bible many women have fashioned their lives and dreams after that you know and so and men as well they want to marry a queen like esther and the women want to be you know go for a pageant and the man chooses you says that is the one hallelujah but uh, pigeon <laughs> i'd like you to please share with us you know just as we begin to journey thank you pastor i am uh, you know i'll make this very quick so we can go to the meat of the matter is that okay is that an agreement yes, okay sir. So tonight, we are very open to the navigation of the Holy Spirit. And we are not setting any boundaries for him tonight. We're trusting him to take us in the direction he chooses for himself. We are looking at what Esther signifies to the body of Christ, to us as individuals, in, in life's relationships. 
and even in romantic relationships. So to that extent, tonight we might be seeing Esther as a type and shadow of Christ. At some point, we'll be localizing Esther as us and God. And at certain point, we'll be seeing what God did when he used marriage as a metaphor to describe Christ and himself and the body of and the, and the church. So we'll be delving into a lot of conversations around positioning by God, the activation of destiny based on life's preparation. We'll be trusting God tonight to look at what Esther represents for, for us or to us as, as the body of Christ even now. And without preempting, I would like us to go into scriptures and go into speaking with our guests because I'll be asking more questions tonight than um, preferring answers. But I'm hoping for us to have a very robust conversation. What does it mean to be married to a noble, to a great man? Beginning first with the root of our marriage to God, right? And then bringing it down to our relationship, our physical, earthly relationship. How do we position ourselves to be that person relevant to the noble? and working hand in hand fulfilling god's purpose here on earth those are the areas which we're trusting the holy spirit to help us navigate tonight so i don't know if i had amen thank you so very much um p jude as you were speaking it just crossed my mind that it's a good time if you want to to take notes i believe there'll be many learning points for us to take away with us so that it's you know it's wisdom loaded loaded with wisdom and then p jude also talked about purpose isn't it interesting that we've often said that marriage is about purpose you know marriage as some people would say is it oils the wheel of purpose by the grace of god and would even see in the in this story of esther and the king how it was very purposeful it was a very purposeful marriage before we move on to pastor mildred i'll just ask for a second i want to hear from pastor dell in terms of um, just your thoughts on the lady and her lover Well, all you are doing is delaying the inevitable. We are all here for something this evening. However, since you put me out here, what, I mean, what comes to my mind is, um, without, without, without being overly graphic, what comes to my mind is, uh, for the lady and her lover, it's for me the depth of relationship. It's for me the levels of intimacy, the levels of interaction, the, 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 the sort of... Uh, strategies if you like or the sort of style or the sort of way that we interact now that's the that's like a definition but how do we how do we fit scripture into that how do we find ourselves in that picture how do we learn from Esther and how she navigated her intimate relationship and her marriage to her lover so that, those, those are my thoughts brilliant thank you very much sir now move on to Pastor Mildred Pastor M P M. The lady and her lover, when it comes to dealing with love, relationship, marriage, purpose, Christ, the word of God, it's one that you have a lot of experience in. So it would be wonderful to hear your thoughts on the lady and her lover, especially with regards to Esther and the king. Okay, good evening, everybody, once again. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said before, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I don't think that we can really talk about Esther and the king without first talking about Esther's predecessor, and which is why the Bible starts off with her. I could have just jumped to the king needed a wife and then they decided to pick someone. But they had to show us that something had happened before that. Um, they had to show us what had gone wrong, such that when you see, when Esther is now introduced, you can really appreciate everything that she is and what she stands for. So I think the most important thing for me about Esther is not really just her beauty. It's not even just favor. It's not even the fact that she had helpers or that she was submitted. I don't think that's the only thing. I think the fact that she had a very healthy self-esteem. For you to enter into a marriage or a relationship and really get the best of it, you must have a strong sense of identity. And she was loved. The Bible tells us that even though she was an orphan, she was loved. Her uncle Mordecai loved her. He took her in and took care of her as his own. Yes. 
And not only did he do that, he didn't raise her like a slave. He raised her as a Jew. They're two different things. Even though they were slaves, he didn't want her to get it at, into her head that you're a slave and you're not worthy of competing with other girls. So he told her, when you get there, don't tell anybody who you are. Be a Jew, but don't become a slave. And then go there on the same level playing field with all the other girls so that you don't start to feel inferior or start to do things that you shouldn't do. So she had a healthy self-image. And I think that that's the one thing that Jesus came to do for us. He came to show us that we were worth it. So he left heaven, came down to earth, did everything he did, died, rose again, just to give us a sense of identity and to show us that no matter who you are, you are so loved by God that he will go the extra mile just to get you. And when you come from that, that place of, I am loved by God, you can have such a beautiful relationship with the king because he will spare no expense. He will hold nothing back. In fact, when Esther eventually, and I think I'm jumping ahead of myself, when Esther eventually went to the king to ask for a favor, he said, ask me anything, even up to half of my kingdom. He was telling her, you are worth so much more than you know. Because she spent so much time praying before she got to him. But she was loved. Maybe she had forgotten, but she was loved. And that sometimes is where I find, you know, us as Christians, our relationship with God, we forget. So, and our relationships, even as human beings, in marriage, if you don't have a healthy self-image, you're going to make poor choices. You're going to choose the wrong person. You're going to marry the wrong person. So the first place I would start is, you know, a healthy self-image. And that's what Mordecai did for her. And that's what Jesus did for us. He gave us a very healthy self-image. Now, the second thing I, I love about Esther and what I learned from her in terms of relationship is that she, she was very wise. She learned. She was a learner. She didn't, she didn't just say, you know, I'm beautiful and that's enough. She was wise. Why do I think that? I think she was very wise because she learned from her predecessor's mistakes. Now, there have been many arguments around Vashti and why she said no and all of that. And for a long time, I, was, I actually believed all the things I had heard. Until one day, the Holy Spirit said, go and look for yourself. Go and study this thing for yourself. I'd heard that the king was drunk, and so he wanted to parade her naked and all of that. And that's, that's the, the narrative that is being pushed every day. And so, of course, at this point, you'll be confused as to why was she punished for standing for what is right? Why would anybody allow herself to be degraded? But I had to go back and look at that. I'm not going to do the word study with you tonight. Don't worry. <laughs> but I had to take my time to actually look. That, the scripture never said anything about the king being drunk. In fact, one of the most accurate translations of that scripture is the New American Standard Bible. And I think verse 8 or so, if you'd allow me to just read it, yes, of the first chapter. Let me see. Okay. That's Esther chapter 1, verse 8. Yes. I'm reading the New American Standard Bible. It's, at, at this point, it I talked about there being... Um, you know, a celebration for 180 days. Yes. And for a long time, I thought that was a party. No, the celebration was the king showing his splendor. So almost like, you know, having a museum set up and showing everything that he had. And people could go around and see it. And it was at the end of that 180 days that he had a party for, you know, seven days. And so if you read the scripture after that, verse 8, it says... But the drinking, so he had said, giving them drink and food. He says, but the drinking was done according to the royal law. There was no compulsion. For so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he was to do as each person pleased. So nobody was forced to drink. In fact, at the point where the king got angry and spoke to Memican, you would see that he was very articulate. He didn't sound drunk. The king himself too didn't sound drunk. So at this point, I'm saying, okay, what happened? The king was very happy. He was, yes, he had been drinking, he had been partying, so he was in a good place. He was merry, he was happy. But he was celebrating outside. Now the queen was inside his palace. She was celebrating with her women inside his palace. So this is the king. The queen is celebrating. The queen is, his, is the queen by his pleasure. He chose her. 
then she's doing the party with his money, literally. And then she's having the party in his house. He's outside, she's inside, she's, he's in the garden. And at some point, he just says, you know what? He sends them, and if you do the word study, the word command, the first word that was used for command there was actually tell her. It wasn't commander. It was tell her, ask her to come. You know, and let her come in a royal attire. Let her come with a crown and everything. Let her come out and greet the people. He was so pleased at all his accomplishments. He wanted to show them that this is the icing on the cake. And then he sends for her. And if you read between verse 10 and 15, at some point, it moved from asking her to come to demanding her to come because the Bible says that she utterly refused. That's the original um, Hebrew. It says she utterly refused to come. And so the king at that point became angry. And this is where I think it's important that you look into her life and see that there's a way to marry great men. And that's one of the things that I noticed in her life. Esther watched Vashti miss it. So she knew what to do not to miss it. I don't have a problem with Vashti saying no. Maybe not too much of a problem. Let me not lie. I have a bit of a problem because, I mean, you are rude. The king can't send for you and you say no. Who are you? You know? But what I'm more concerned about is how nobody could speak up for her. Nobody could beg for her. Nobody spoke for her. But if you look at Esther's life, so many people were speaking for her. So obviously Esther was more pleasant. If you're going to marry great people, you will know that there are many voices in their lives. And you must be careful not to step on those toes. Vashti told all the eunuchs, go to hell. Seven of them. Seven, seven. yes. So they must have come. Maybe, I don't even think the seven came together. I think it was one by one. The king said, you should please come, ma. Come dressed in your... Say, why? You will get out of here. Can't you see I'm entertaining? And you see, when the king was angry, this is another lesson that we must learn, especially in light of what's going on now. The king was angry. They said he was rough. That's he was furious. He didn't go in there and grab her by the hair and say, how dare you? He calmed down and calmly asked, what should be done to someone? He asked for the law. And today as Christians, in Christian homes, when your wife does not submit to you, submission should not be taken by force. You should ask, what does the law say? And the law of Christ, the law of love, says you should love her into submission. So the king didn't go there and drag her hair and say, how dare you? I'm sending for you. It's my money you ever used to throw at the party. Who do you think you are? No. He asked what should be done. And the law at that time said, replace her. Let her royal position be taken from her. Now when you read that scripture, you can just think, oh, they're taking her away. No. That, the actual word, and that's why I said I don't want to do word study with you today, but it's important. The word actually talks about realms and domains. So she was not just a queen in name. Vashti had kingdoms she was ruling. Maybe the scripture doesn't tell us how many, but she was a woman who also had authority. Now, if you look at King Xerxes, maybe we can get a glimpse of the kind of power she had from the kind he offered Esther. Yes. He said, I will give you even up to half of my kingdom, meaning that he was that kind of king who was not afraid to let his wife fly. Yeah. He was comfortable with helping her so if if i need to give you half of my kingdom i'm okay i'm secure i'm not an insecure man I'm still the king still anyway the king. so he was okay with them having power but the problem was that the power got to our head it became he's a king i'm a queen so how can he send for me i'm busy too He's busy entertaining, I'm busy entertaining. I'm not going to leave my own guests and go out and entertain or greet his own guests. And that sometimes shows me the picture of what we as Christians do on a daily basis with Christ. God did not get us as slaves. We are sons and daughters set on this earth to run the family business, to run the earth. So he wants us to rule and to do whatever it is that he has called us here to do on earth. But when the king requires your attention, you show up. Hallelujah. And that was one thing Vashti did not know. But Esther learned. When it was her turn, she got to the king. When the king finally, and I mean, we'll still talk about how, you know, how she couldn't go to the king just like that. But when the king eventually extended, you know, his hand to her and said, come. She, asked, she told him, I won't throw you a party. He came for the party the first day. 
And he asked her, what do you want? She said, no, I want to throw you another party. No, I'm giving you the attention Vasti didn't give you. I want to double it. I want to show you how important you are to me. So one of the things I love about her is how quick she was to learn. Maybe it was the eunuchs that told her the story. Maybe because she wasn't there. I say, ah, don't be like this woman. She's mean. Maybe there was something about her that made people feel special around her. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I've come to find out that when it comes to favor, people usually bestow favor on you when you make them feel good about themselves. Right. So she must have gone there and not made them feel like, Sorry, what do you Sorry, can you know? say that again? People who bestow favor on you when, when you make, make them, them feel, feel good about, about themselves. themselves. So she didn't go there and feel, maybe like the other ones who knew what they wanted. Keep quiet, you're just an eunuch, I'm here for the king. And, and don't we do that every day? If you're going to see an MD, you don't greet the gate man. If you're going to, to, to the secretary, you can walk past her. Who is she? I'm here to see. I have an appointment with the MD. But she treated the eunuchs well. So they told her what to do. They probably told her, don't treat people like don't do. They were giving her advice because she was a girl who was used to being mentored. Her uncle mentored her. So she was already used to asking for advice. So she walked into that place. And maybe, I don't know the full story, but I like to think that I was a fly on the wall at some point, <laughs> looking at what was going on in that place. Because how come she was the only one that everybody was helping? Yes. How come? So it means that people could speak to the king. It means that people could speak up for Vashti, but nobody did. So what kind of person was she? Whatever kind of person she was, Esther knew not to be that person. And so she used Vashti to learn lessons on how to marry the king. Because as they always say, Cain with and take flog first wife. He did wait second one. So she knew that whatever mistake this woman had made, I better not make it. So that's the first, the first and most important thing that I know about her. The fact that she was a girl of great wisdom. Yes. She was, she was a girl of great wisdom. And from what you've said, she was a girl of great character as well. She was such that she made people around her feel good about themselves. And doesn't this sound very familiar? You would think that Pastor Mildred had been attending our uh, sessions since the series started, because everything, because you know, we had mentioned that we talked about her relationship with Mordecai, with the eunuchs, everything you said were the things that we had spoken about. So it's just so amazing. Like you gave us a crash course of what had been. We're going to watch the full videos, by the way. But you know, there are many things that you said, and we're going to, I would love for us to delve, maybe break it down a bit more. And Pedro, I'd like you to, you know, and Pedro, just step in here as well with regards to some of the things that Pastor Mildred has highlighted. Number one, very importantly, was what she learned from Vashti. So we'd done a whole day of, a whole evening of speaking about Vashti, what could, what couldn't have been, and what Esther learned. Beyond that, very importantly, was how to marry a great person. I know, as Pidge, you said earlier on, it's not just about, it's not just one way. It is how to marry a great person as a man feeling secure enough. And I'm glad that Pastor Mildred talked about it already, how the king demonstrated in latter parts of the scripture that he was securing himself as king. He didn't feel that in giving Esther half of the kingdom, she was going to become unruly or she was going to lose her head. So he was comfortable enough. So both ways, as a woman, what you do, because how many of us want to marry great men? Okay, maybe I should. How many of us don't want to marry great men? Uh -huh. All right, so we want to marry greatness, or we are married, or we want to we want to bring out the greatness in the man that we are married to. How? What are the what? What are the what? What character? What traits would you possess? That's one. And as a man, you want to be handed a great gift like Esther, because Esther was a gift. Do we agree? It's not every man that can handle and harness and nurture that gift. As a man, how do you nurture that gift? How do you, what kind of men are married to Esther's? Okay. Why, I don't know why you just took me away from the, the, the course I was attending right Sorry. now. But it's okay. But, but, I mean, you said a couple of things, uh, Pastor Ayo, and I'll try to touch on a few then we'll hand the button back to our guest for tonight. Because, you know, when you, when you get Pastor Mildred, just get everything you can get, at, at least for the evening. You had mentioned it. Today, we are gender fluid. Not in the sense that the world knows gender fluidity. We are, we are speaking to both genders. We're speaking to the men 
and to the women. There is a, she said, there is a protocol. There's a way to marry a great person. And the seed of greatness is in each and every one of us. So what that means is that as a believer, we must therefore understand the protocol of marrying each other that the Lord will lead us to. You know, when we get to the point where we begin to be so insecure, we can't let the other fly and we begin to compete one with another, it is best to be single and compete with yourself so that you don't go and stop anybody's destiny whether male or female right and pastor Mildred appealed that we keep it very practical i remember the first day i met uh, my wife i'll be i'll be married 11 years in the next couple of weeks Please. i'm in kindergarten don't ask pastor Dell. pastor Dell, i'm just i'm just shadowing pastor Dell and pastor Mildred. pastor Mildred is 18 right 17 and he, he is in the decades. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Pastor Jude, mention my own now. Uh, I know uh, I'm safe here in kindergarten. Uh, yeah, you are in preparatory class. <laughs> You'll get there. But my point again is from the first day I met her, no, I understood that this one is a king, irrespective of her gender. Right? Studying in medical school, looking all frail and rough on all the edges. I knew. So that even till like two, three weeks ago, now she's doing great where she's at. But I kept reminding her, I keep reminding her that you are in transition. So we must build capacity on this one you're doing because this is practice ground for where you are going to. So, so, so she, she steps out of the house to go have meetings with ministers, with governors, right? And in my bedroom, they're having conversations with governors, with ministers, with and, and, and sorry, babes, I didn't, I didn't mean to do this, but but if you are that guy that you have not dealt with you <laughs> to smile and say, That's my girl. That's right. And when she's done, you say you did great at this, but don't sell yourself short. I was going to say your head has to be correct because the moment you stand in the way of God's child then you are resisting God himself there is a destiny there is a purpose and this goes both ways we see subtly couples begin to compete I get your ma I get masters so you go get your own masters it's good to encourage one another build one another up but by the time we begin to mark register for each other and the i and the me begins to come in when she said it Zexy said i'll give you half the kingdom no threat so pastor mildred you are going to build on that fact yeah. how did esther build herself to the point of acceptance i have my i, I said i have my own question pastor yes, we'll sir. come back to you to the point of acceptance what did Mordecai do to that lady that she stood before the king of Medes and Persia, the king himself, and he soon began to play with two noble men like chess pieces. Come back for another meal. It's not food that the king has not eaten before. What built this woman? To the point where she knew that though I have them in my palms but tact and timing is still key in this matter what do we need to do my, my own question I'm not done what do we need to do to get to that point of security to know that this is my tough I am a slave girl here but the fact that my feet is in this boardroom uh, no impostor syndrome. I, ha I don't come. I don't come. I have arrived. And the purpose of God over this small slave girl's life must be fulfilled. No fear, no threat. How did Esther get to that point? Those are my own questions. Pastor, you're sorry. I took the moderation for me. Okay. Um, I think I started with it. 
that Mordecai was very intentional in parenting her. I think that, you know, for the Jews, the Jews are also very in touch, well, from the scriptures, shows us that they were very in touch with their covenant with God. So even though they were slaves at the time, they knew who God was. Um, I think we lose our sense of God sometimes because of how the world is now. But at the time, God was everything to them, such that they would bring offerings. It was, it was such a simple principle. If God wasn't accepting their offerings, they would know. It was so, they were so clear on their identity. The fact that they had a covenant with God controlled everything that they did. So Mordecai was intentional in parenting her. Like I said before, he brought her up as a Jew, not a slave. He, he kept that thing out of, if you, if you look at that story, I mean, read between the lines, you can see that he told her, don't say who you are when you get there. Don't let them define you. Don't define yourself. Sometimes we walk into situations and we already say, I'm, you know, I'm the youngest person in this place or I'm the smallest person in this place. And that happened a lot through scriptures. We we're like grasshoppers before them yeah. in our own in eyes our own. and then in their own in eyes too. But that's not true. The people were afraid of them. It was how they saw themselves. So he was very clear. Don't go there and define yourself. Don't go there and say, I'm a slave girl. So if she put that in front, she wouldn't have been able to compete at the same level with them. So he was very intentional about parenting her, intentional about pumping in the right thing into her. And then she also understood, and I think this is where we need to you know, really pay close attention. She, I said it before, she understood the power of mentoring. She saw where mentoring had brought her, but there's only so far that Mordecai can take her. Mordecai couldn't go into the harem with her. So she had to submit herself to someone else. You can have many teachers. So she had to submit herself to someone else. And when she became queen, nothing changed. Mordecai would come every day and check up on her. So every day he would still come and have conversations with her. Are you okay? Are you doing this? Hope you haven't told them. Hope you haven't defined yourself. Hope you have. He kept on. He was still present in her life. And a lot of times... We outgrow some of our teachers a bit too quick, if you ask me. And so we end up, when we get to the place where we are now, in quote, royalty, we haven't even attained perfection, but we're, in quote, royalty in our own eyes. We start to criticize those we should be learning from. And I think that that has become one of the things that we're very good at in this generation. We go on social media and, and bring out all the mistakes our fathers have made. All the, well, you see, you can never really say what you would do if you were in their shoes. So instead of complaining or criticizing them, we should be learning from them. And so this girl, even though she was in, in the palace, her, her uncle would come every day without fail. Which was why she noticed something was wrong when he came in ash, ash, um, sackcloth and ashes. And she immediately wanted to solve the problem by... No, I, I must cover my uncle. This, the man said, that's not what we're here for. You want to cover him? You think you're safe? There's a bigger problem. This is not what we're doing here. Solve the problem. And so he, he, he also still demanded from her not to forget why she was put there. They're always about purpose. Read everywhere you read in the scriptures about the Jews. They are very, they're purposeful people. They always know why they are somewhere. They always know what they are doing. They're never anywhere by chance. He said to her, maybe you were born for such a time as this. There's a reason why you are here. Now, I know that a lot of times we talk about how um, God used her to save her people. But I also think that God used her to preserve her legacy. Because remember, the king was her husband. If he had messed up, if he had been the king that killed all the Jews, that would be her legacy as well. So God used her to save her husband as well. It wasn't only her people. God, you start to save her husband. That make sure you are not the one because God will come after anyone who touches his people. So the king would have been wiped out. But it was just her. So a lot of times we look at how oh, the king was instrumental. She was very instrumental in saving two people. So her marriage was not just about her. And this is one of the reasons why I always say that marriage is not a reward. It's an assignment. She went into that marriage knowing fully well that I'm going to be, be here to save my people, but I'm also here to preserve my husband's legacy. This man was an unbeliever, remember. She had a difficult assignment to go and tell her husband that this thing you're about to do is going to be bad. A lot of times, we can't even correct our spouses because we don't want them to feel bad. 
We don't want them to be angry. We don't want them to look at us a certain way. They don't, we don't want them to think we're proud. But she knew that this thing had to be done. So what did she do? Even though the word prayer and God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, not once. But when she said, fast for me, I believe she insinuated prayer. Maybe it was code for them at that time. Because you couldn't come out and say that you were, you were a Jew. And there, there were certain things Jews were known for. Prayer. They would pray a certain number of times a day. Mordecai would not even bow to anybody but God. So he was known as Mordecai the Jew, which means this is how these people are. So she, already, she was already raised in a certain way. So I believe that parenting was instrumental to everything that happened in her life. Wow. That Mordecai knew that this girl, I'm not going, it was, it was very clear. Her parents died, but they said he took her in. And I believe that he took her in and was intentional about parenting her, telling her this is who you are. And this is what I think we must do with our children. Remind them who you are. This is who you are. You are greatness. You shouldn't take this. You, shouldn't, you, can't, you can indoctrinate them from when they are young. You must be very intentional about it. Those are the children that do well in the future. Thank you, Pastor right. Neil Jared. Uh, awesome. Pastor there. <laughs> they asked you a question earlier. So. Um, so my mind is reeling. And my mind is reeling because um, there's something that happens when you hear the word of God and you hear it from a different context. So none of this is new but there's an illumination that comes with a different perspective. So, for me, I, 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 I sort of feel Pastor Mildred is, is, is downloading to us so fast that we can lose some of the essence. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So, so I go back to the first thing you said, ma'am, which is that Esther was loved, right? Yes. By who? I don't mind if you talk back to me. Uh, we have a live audience. By who? She was loved by everybody. There was something about her that was irresistible to everybody. But even, I don't even want to talk about everybody. I want to talk about her, her father, to all intents and purposes, which is Mordecai. And a lot of us have children. Some of us yet to have children. There's something about the love you give a child that that child cannot be deceived in the future because they already know that's what Mordecai put in this woman yeah. so she was loved which led to the self esteem you were talking about if you have self esteem you are invincible that's the truth but I have a question because why I'm saying that it seems like Pastor Mueller is downloading faster than we can comprehend is because we have a God does he love us yes does he love us unconditionally? Yes, he does. Why don't we have self-esteem? That's my question. And so that's something to pause for a second yeah. and consider. Because there's no reason why we are not invincible. No reason at all in my mind. It's clear as that. So if we know that there is a God, if we know that he gave his only son for us, what more love than that? If we know that there's nothing that... You know, you know, is 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 due to us that he has withheld. Why are we struggling with even our own identity to start with? Because self-esteem is not going to fall from the sky and and you know fall on you. No. You're going to have to get it by revelation of who you are. Yeah. Step one. So that just is like is like just hanging in front of my mind there that I hope we understand what we are hearing. So it's not just this, it's not just we're not saying these things to be to sound nice and encouraging. There's there is a person here, maybe more than one, that needs to go back to God and say, I need help with self-esteem. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And then we go on and we say, She learned from another person's mistakes. Some of us will see mistakes or see things happen, which are mistakes, and just not identify that they're mistakes and even do it because it seemed like a good idea at the time. This is what everybody's doing. Oh yeah. Let us go and do it. So if it's, if it's the vogue for a Vashti to say, you know what, I'm also doing okay. Don't, don't, don't talk to me anyhow. I, I'm not a small girl. Somebody else will say, ah, that's a good woman. Smart. She knows what she's doing. How can you be talking to her anyhow? And then she becomes the model. So it's also not automatic to, to learn from another's mistakes. It is a skill. 
We even want to say there's a way to marry a great man. So it's, it's like I'm doing a recap already, but I'm just, those things are just in front of my, my, my spirit to say, I hope we are engaging these things. You know? So there's a posture for the child of God. There's a posture for the one who is loved and the one who has, who has attained self-esteem in who they are before God. Because that is the ultimate identity of every child of God. There is a posture for somebody who can discern just by looking at a situation or being advised about something and to say, you know what, that's not the way to do this. So, so I love the way you said it that she knew, Esther knew what not to do because she had seen it. So, so that's it's an easy thing when you can see what didn't work and you can say, you know what, that's the one I'm not going to do. Let's do something else. And she had that favor. There was something about that woman. Yeah everybody wanted to help her. I mean, people that she didn't know wanted to help her. Eunuchs were queuing up to help her. You know? So it's just to say, just an encouraging, you know, it's like, a, let's call this the mid, mid-program mid encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> to say, there is a posture for the child of God. Yeah. Let us begin to think about our own lives and how we're going to engage this. That, that's it for now. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, P. Del. And, and just as, yes, please. <laughs> For P. Dell, for P. Jude, for Pastor Mildred. And as P. Dell was speaking, you know, we thought, oh yes, this is a great time for us to take that time of reflection. And just spend some time worshipping and then when we come back, don't forget we have Tomiwa in the audience who is monitoring comments online and also going to be taking questions here. But beyond that, I think before, when we come back, we will be finding our way to the Q&A. But before we get there, i just like Pastor Mildred to speak on just after worship. You speaking, you know, what Pastor Dell said, what P. Jude has said about self-esteem, knowing who you are, and how that sometimes drives people into the wrong relationships. Bearing in mind that you said that marriage is an assignment, it's not a reward. It's serious business. However, some people are you know they stay in wrong relationships because they don't even know how to that they are destined for a king or that they deserve better in terms of how they are treated so it'd be great to speak to that you know for those who are in you know who are not married yet and even for those who are married so we'll go on a break or no it's not a break really it's just for us to really spend some time worshiping and hopefully the holy spirit is speaking to us as pedal has said i do believe by the grace of god that there are people here that the lord is giving you a picture of who you are from his word telling you that you are precious you are worth it pastor mildred started by saying that your identity is found in the fact that jesus christ loved you enough to die for you you are loved we'll just hand over to one music now bless your name jesus behold the lion of hell oh zion can't you see there's a lion seated here. Behold the lion of hell, all nations tribe and drum. He's the lion king of kings. Behold the lion of hell, oh Zion, can't you see? There's a lion seated here. Behold the lion of heaven, all nations, tribes, and tongues. He's the lion king of kings. The lion he rose, his reward is with him. His work is before him, salvation he brings. Through to his word, without sin unto salvation. And he will appear unto them that seek for him. He, the lion of heaven, all nations strive and tongue is the lion king of king he's the lion he's the lion king your father is the lion hey, he's the lion and the lamb you are the lion you're seated in the heavenlies and 
Tonight we subject our hearts to you for the rest of the conversation. We yield our spirit to you. I sense in this place tonight, the Lord is about to begin to shift mindsets. I, I, I don't know if you can discern it, that the next few minutes will be very, very critical to every life that is tuned and that is hooked up to me in this meeting. And I pray by the spirit of God that light and revelation the same that comes by the entrance of God's word will come to you in strength by the spirit of God tonight barriers will be broken scales will fall off light will come thank you father Lord we submit to you Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ amen pastor Ayo, I, I just feel thank you one music thank you I just feel that before going to the other part of this conversation I want to read this scripture and I'll probably just pass the baton back to you to stir our conversation the fifth chapter of Esther from the first verse I read from the Berean study Bible it says on the third day Esther put on her royal attire stood in the inner court of the palace across from the king's quarters the king was sitting on his royal throne in the royal courtroom facing the entrance as soon as the king saw queen esther standing in the court she found favor in his sight the king extended the gold scepter in his hand towards esther and she approached and touched the tip of the scepter what is it queen esther the king inquired what is it you what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given to you. Verse 4. I'll stop in the next two verses. If it pleases the king, Esther replied, May the king and Haman come today to the banquet I have prepared for the king. Hori commanded the king and bring Haman so we can do as Esther requested. Just in creating a framework for this Alaska batch of the conversation, 
I think the Lord would like us to look at the protocol of this union, king and bride. I don't want us to go back to verse 6 because she will distract us. But if you contrast, yeah. there was one queen. Yeah. There was an occasion for her to be dressed in the royal apparel, to be seen by the king. Right. She wasn't there. But there was another queen on a normal day, on every regular day. You would have noticed that the king was sitting, probably just lounging, right? The first thing she did, she put on her royal apparel. She didn't say the familiarity did not kick in, right? And she approached him and waited because she knew the protocol of advancing in the presence of royalty. Now, when the king stretched forth the scepter, she understood what to do. She approached it and touched it. A well choreographed process land flawlessly executed. We would like Pastor Mildo to speak around timing, tact, and the wisdom of God and discernment. First, in our vertical uh, relationship with God and the relationships around us, especially with our life partners. How we must guard against familiarity. How we must also understand the sacredness of everything the Lord has instituted. We must journey around this marriage call. That's why I, said I don't want Vashti to, dis to distract us. And then when the king asks, what do you want? You could see tact also at play there. So you help us, Pastor Ayo, navigate this journey. Yeah. Pastor Jude, already there, sir. You have navigated it. <laughs> but, I mean, such an exposition. And that's the beautiful thing about Richard. This is what happens here. We have time to really di dissect and dimension. So, Pastor Mildred, I'm now handing over to you with the protocol and the flawlessness of the arrangement. And, and the timeliness, <laughs> man. To, but that's such a powerful point, you know. Um, the king asked... I, when you read about how Esther was, in quotes, almost very, very careful to approach the king, it reminds you of how powerful the king is or was. That, well, the Vashti's response made the king look a bit weak. So we could see that even her approach, you would see that this, you forgot the man you were dealing with. So please, ma, please go ahead. So... I I, like I said before, it's very hard to talk about this relationship without talking about the previous relationship. Even the Bible couldn't do it. The Bible had to first show us how Vashti's relationship was. So she did everything different than what Vashti did. That's the truth. She came in knowing this is what the king likes. He'd like to see his queen dressed in royal attire. So she dressed up for that purpose. And she showed up. And immediately she showed up as the queen. Something in the king kicked in. This is my own. Are you seeing my... I can't... I, I get I. See, this is mine, you know? It made him feel good about himself. And that's why, you know, I keep going back to that thing about Esther. There was something very special about her that everyone felt good in her presence. So she stepped in and the king felt like a king. You know, and I think it's um, Mike Mudok that says that there's a fool and a king in every man and it's the one you speak to that responds to you. Yeah. So she the king in him responded to the queen that she was. Because that's what started the fight in the first place. Go and tell her to come in a royal attire. Let everyone see. Without telling her, you see, and this is, this is what we must know in relationships, married relationships. Sometimes we must understand that your partner doesn't necessarily want to ask for that thing. What makes a married beautiful is that you can tell, this is what my partner will like. This is what my partner will need and you go ahead and fulfill that need pretty much what jesus did for us he anticipated that we would need a savior and so before we even asked for one while the bible says while we were yet sinners christ died for us Pastor Peter, they are putting me in trouble because i'm looking i'm i'm just deliberately not looking at certain side of the room because someone has told me <laughs> that if i say it then they, they forget there's no point if i say this is what i want then you miss the magic. 
out of it. Go ahead, man. <laughs> once, once they ask for it, you've lost some points. <laughs> And, and so that's how it is, really, in a marriage relationship. Now, in the relationship with the king, what I really like about th what happened in that place was not only that she saw that he was a king and deserved everything that she could bring. You know, she didn't just come in and just say, he's my husband, let me just stroll in. Uh, if, he, if I perish, I perish. After all, I'm fasting. So let me just go and let him know. Let me come with sackcloth. He, 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 no, it was a rule at that time that you couldn't come in mourning. So that's why she was trying to keep Mordecai outside. Don't come in. Change your clothes. Mordecai, that's not, what, that's not the issue. That's not what we're saying. We're about to die. You're talking of clothes. So she, she went into that place knowing that this is how I must relate with the king. And when the king stretched out his hand to her and she stepped up to him, she waited. When she, when he stepped, up to, when she stepped up to him, he said, anything you want up to half my kingdom. And this is what she did. She asked for fellowship first. She chose fellowship over what she wanted. She said, it's not, I know you can give me everything. I know you even know that I have need of these things. So I'm not even going to come and ask you. Come, let me give to you too. And that's what we must do with God. We must consistently offer worship. Because our Father knows that we need the things we're always asking for. And this is where, I wasn't planning to bring it up tonight, but it kind of bothers me the way Christians have turned prayer into just asking for needs. Where we are every single day saying, do it, do it, do it. Give me, give me, give me, give me. And God is like, I know that you need these things. How about we have a conversation? How was your day yesterday? How did you feel? I want to talk to you. I want to know you. And I want you to know you. Because if you talk to me, I can tell you who you are. And so that was what she did. She, and even after the first day when the king had, king was happy, he, had, he felt like a king. She treated him well. And that's the thing in marriage as well. We must learn to treat each other well. It's not just about Esther treating, but she also knew. And you see, like I said, she knew how to make the king feel good. Esther had a problem. She could have told the king, when the king said, I'll give you up to half my kingdom, what that meant was I would give you as much power as I control. She could have taken it and gone to solve her problem. But allowing the king be the king in bringing the issue to him is one thing that we must learn. We must learn the art of that, especially women. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not against um, women fighting for rights and the whole feminism, something. I'm not going there because they will drag me tomorrow now. But my point is this. It's okay to let men be men. Because there's a superhero in every man. There's a savior in every man. He wants to bless you. But when you don't even allow him that small, I got this, I got this. You don't got it, man. Just allow him got you. It's really okay. Do you understand? It's okay. It's okay for you to, as they say, relax and be taken care of. And she understood that. She came to the king. She could have said, you know what? King has given me power. Okay, so now I'm just going to make this decree. She didn't do that. She allowed the king to still take charge of the situation. And so in our lives, when we have issues, sometimes just love on God and let God do it. All the worrying, all the extra fasting and prayer, all the everything we're doing. The Holy Spirit is just saying, why do you like to suffer like this? What really is the issue? Don't you want to be helped? You don't want to be loved? Your father is in charge. Relax. But in those kind of relationships where we feel like because God has given us authority on the earth, we, we need to hustle. Relax. And that's one thing Esther knew. Esther understood that even though I'm a queen, I can allow myself respect the king and honor him enough to remain king in my life. And so that for me was a beautiful relationship that each person knew their place. And the king, knowing he was the king, always offered to help. What do you want me to do for you? I am sovereign. I can do whatever you want. Tell me what you need. That was his constant approach to his wife what do you need how can i bless you what do you want what can i help you with that was constantly where he was with her in that relationship and so in our relationship not to with men, each other not to men yes. not to men yes. what do you need <laughs> and so in our relationship with each other everybody must enjoy their role Enjoy your role. Enjoy being a blessing to each other at different points in time. Enjoy giving to each other at different points. The king wanted to be, in quotes, worshipped and honored. And she gave him that. She was not, she, was, she never jumped ahead of herself. She allowed it to be his timing. And this is something we struggle with as human beings. God, if you don't do this thing by December, 
<laughs> when I finish backsliding, even you, you will not know. You know, <laughs> God, if you don't give me husband, you will see my true colors. And the only thing is like, at what color do you want to be again more than this? <laughs> so we must understand that God controls the timings and the seasons. And God is in charge of everything. So we must also be confident in his love. And I think that really is what Esther and the king's relationship was about. She was confident in his love. She said, if I get there, and this man... You know, I also think about it sometimes. And I don't know if I'm taking us away from... When she said, the king has not sent for me for one month thought to myself, some other women would be panicking and be in worry mode. But I think that she still kept her head. And she kept preparing for the day the king would send for her. So she understood how to wait. So Jesus has not yet returned. But how are we waiting? I'll be back. He hasn't come back. I'm sure he told her that oh, don't worry. I'll send for you soon. And she was waiting. And at some point she realized that, you know what? I need to take a step forward and remind the king that I'm still here. That's what worship does. I'm still here, Lord. I'm still here. And I'm going to keep loving on you. I'm going to keep worshiping you. I'm going to keep giving you delight till you do what it is that is in your heart to do for me. Because the funny thing is that Esther probably didn't have a, comp a full picture of what the solution should look like. But when the king stepped in, he made it so neat that a festival came out of it. Please let us celebrate. Are celebrate clapping, Jesus. You are let us just clap. clap. That was. Oh gosh. There were, oh my. We, this is master class. I don't even know how to. I don't know what to say. Extra master class. You know. What came out for. Please. What came out for you. You know. The thing about when we come for meetings like this. Is that there's a message for you. And Pastor Jude already prayed for this second half that it's going to, there's going to be a shift. And for different people, it's going to mean different things. So find your shift. Whilst Pastor Mildred was speaking, I just remembered that you must, con Ayo, you must continue to do things that would make your king. Now I'm talking about my heavenly father. Ask you, what can I do for you? You know, position yourself such in worship and praise. Not coming to complain or demand, but just fellowship fellowship so powerful thank you so much all right our time is far spent and i think in the course of our questions we will probably answer some of the things that you know some of the things that we have in our, on our minds so i hand over to tomiwa now and tomiwa i know there's some people so if you have questions online as well please this is the time thank you so much pastor aya good evening family Good evening. I'm sure we're so excited. I certainly am excited to, you know, be reminded of how loved we are by God and the position and preparedness we have to be in, you know, to respond to that type of love. I know we have questions, so just signify by raising your hands and I will walk up to you and ask your questions. I see a question right there. I'll walk up to you and online as well i'm here to take, to take your questions so just drop it and i will be with you shortly good evening everyone good evening ma thank you um the panelist um my question borders on the part where pastor midred said um we should not outgrow our teachers Okay, so now I am bringing into the world of married, like married couples, and um, irrespective of the years of the marriage, you want to, or okay, so at one point in time, parents do come in, especially the mothers, either of the husband or of the wife, for one thing or the other, and over time, we'll be hearing seminars saying that your mom shouldn't overstay, your relative should not overstay and all of this in quote third, part, third parties should not be allowed for too long so i don't know how to marry this statement that we should not over outgrow our teachers in this case whereby they want to every time they always have an input oh the baby's head should be, be like this mm. the legs should be like we should give this we should give that and, and i've experienced my sister who who was married, sometimes the baby is sick and 
from knowledge what my mom used to administer then i'll say okay do this do that she'll say no people know too much and all that all right should we say that that such couple is outgrowing or they don't want to learn or they are shutting the door against this relative right. thank, thank you so much thank you so much pastor mildred can you please help us with that Okay, it's back. Um, thank you for that question. I wasn't really, okay. Um, I wasn't really speaking in that sense, you know, of, um, so let me put it this way. There's a difference between parental advice and parental control. People can give you advice, but when they force you to do what they think, that's when I have a, an issue. People can give you advice. Is the advice separating you and your husband? Is he bringing two of you closer? Is the advice um, helping you in any way or it's causing more problems? You know, but the only reason why you're keeping them around is because you don't want to seem disrespectful to your parents. Um, so I'm, in that light, I'm not really, it's not really the same thing at all. I was talking in terms of general mentoring, okay? So Mordecai gave her advice, but I realized that even though she had entered into the palace and she needed the eunuch's advice because Mordecai has never lived in a harem. The eunuch knew what would happen inside there. It didn't, she now did not despise Mordecai. Mordecai would come every day and still. So there's a difference between honor, honoring your parents and obeying your parents. Okay? Um, you may not obey them at all times. Your parents come now and say you should go and worship a shrine. Are you going to go there? No. Well, I hope not. <laughs> I hope you are not going to go. But you can say politely. You don't have to be disrespectful. You honor them that your parents want me thank you for that advice but i don't think i'm going to go with that right now you know so i'm not saying you should be disrespectful i'm just saying you should be able to um differentiate where advice becomes control do you understand i don't know if i've helped you in any way just also to add thank you pastor Major. just also to also to add we are in a generation where people do not understand the pr biblical principle of honor and I think that's what she's basically addressing. She mentioned that people even go to, up to the extent of anything about your parents or your spiritual parents, a flaw you begin to speak to. No, nobody's saying adapt, accept a bad behavior. But be careful. You shouldn't have an opinion about everything. Be careful what you, what you add your voice to. You know, because the sons of Noah... It was said that their father was drunk and he was nude. The first one went and came and began to speak about it, right? And the second one went, the, the, the other ones with their back turned against their father's nudity. We can spend the whole evening talking about that principle and with a veil, with a garment to cover by the mercies of God. Leave God's servant and his dealing. By the time you, God will use, uh, the, whatever we use you to whip somebody else's servant, your own whipping will be waiting for you. So the, the thing is, just dimensioning the balance. Knowing, she said, learn in quietness. Some of us in our youth, you want to run your mouth. I've said severally to some of my friends that doing some of the things I've done in the last five years, I'm kinder to certain sets of people. My feedback comes a bit more gentle. They say, who no, who no, go, no, no. You've not been there. You don't have contests. So there was a time you drank from them. Honor that. Now you have perspective. They might even have gone lower based on your own exposure. But just still honor the day you still drank from their fountain. I think that's what she was trying to address. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pastor Jude. Thank you. So we have an online question. We have a couple of online questions. But the first one is, Candid with Jewel says, Sometimes it's almost as if being great is synonymous with seasons of waiting waiting for so long for the fulfillment of a promise of perhaps marriage or children how do we navigate through these waiting periods what's the accurate position of our hearts through waiting times 
it does get a bit exhausting. Pastor Drew, do you want to help us with that? Uh, Pastor Mildred. Pastor Mildred. <laughs> let's, let's go. Uh, waiting. I don't think anybody can escape it. Waiting is one of the hardest things. And interesting, I think it's synonymous with Christianity. Waiting, <laughs> you must wait. Um, because it is through faith and patience that you obtain the promise. So the waiting factor can't be taken out. There's seed time and harvest. So that waiting time must be there. Um, when it comes to waiting, the thing you must do is remind yourself of the why and remind yourself of what God said. In that season, you have to just keep reminding yourself. So I'll use myself as an example. It took me a while to have children. It took me eight years. Um, and every time... I would have to go back. Sometimes I would just go back to the promises of God and just be sure it's still there. That none shall be barren in this land, whether male or female. Just seeing it gave me strength to keep waiting because God's word must come to pass. It cannot return to him void. His word returns, but it can't go back empty. It must accomplish what he sent it to do and prosper in the assignment it was given. So keep your face in the word. When it comes to waiting, keep reminding yourself of what God said. And then surround yourself with positive energy. Uh -huh. People that are going through that same thing or who have come out of it. So that you can, you know, that's why God sent Mary to Elizabeth. Yeah. She needed a believable reference. So she needed to see someone who had been through that journey of waiting. Or been through having a special baby. You know, so she, she had to, he had to put her in a space where she could see someone who had been there. So have those kind of positive people around you, people who have been there through it, so that you can keep them in front of you. Waiting is never, it's never easy, but I think the Holy Spirit really helps. Worship. Anytime you worship God, you make Him bigger than that situation. It just reminds you that He's He's big. We're coming out of this, and we're coming out of it strong. Hallelujah! Thank you so much, Pastor Mildred. We have a question in house. Okay, um, good evening, Pastor Midred. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for this insight. I think you have really done justice to this topic. Um, when um, Peter was talking about um, self-esteem, I, I just believe that he was speaking by the um, Spirit of God. I really want to ask, how do you um, um, deal with the issue of this um, self-esteem how do you create an healthy self-esteem that will not be confused with um, um, a self-pride because especially some, sometimes when you know you, you know the truth, you know that um, Jesus Christ died for you you know that you are co heir with Christ all this truth but there's something that has not yet clicked in you and because of that that identity is not really there. So I really want to find out practically how do you begin to form that identity, that healthy self destiny that can help you to, to obtain the promises of God. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would just like to tie it with a similar question online. Tai asks, what do you do to constantly keep your self-esteem thankful every day? To be honest, life doesn't make it easier. So if we can just marry those two questions together and answer them, that would be great. That maybe Pastor Dale will start, and then we'll take it up. Well, um, it's you know your your identity comes from who God says you are. Okay, it's not how you feel. Pastor Mildred just a few seconds ago said she waited some years before she had children. So it wasn't the, when the children arrived that she began to believe. She said she would go back to the word. And in seeing the word, that was her anchor. That gave her strength. That kept her on that journey. So for us all children of God, we are all on a journey. Um, none of us looked like where we are today when we started that journey. Not a single one. So it is in believing first and for me is believing first what God says about me even though I don't look like it I don't smell like it, it there's no, it, you, know, you know there's really nothing around me that fits that narrative but God said so 
So I hold on to that and I begin my journey. And in staying true, now what happens on that journey, a lot will happen. People will tell you, who do you think you are? You, 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 you will encounter all sorts. But the word of God does not change. And it's only our lack of, of uh, you know, standing, if you like, in believing that word. Our lack of consistency in believing the word of God that affects our self-esteem or our perception of life, of ourselves, of situations or circumstances around us. It is because we are not rooted. We are not anchored. If we were anchored, it would be it doesn't make it necessary any less easy to navigate some of the challenges, but we will not lose our way. Yeah. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Pastor Doll. Does anybody else want to add to that? Oh, no. I, I wanted to actually just get um, the perspective because in terms of it crossing from, from being a healthy self-esteem to it being pride, I think that's one area that I'd like for us to expand on, actually. So, Pastor Judah, Pastor Mildred. Adele wants to still go. I mean, yeah, that, that's... I, I'm sorry I skipped that part, but honestly, you can say that there is a fine line between a healthy self-esteem and what could be perceived as pride. If you're proud, you're proud, you know you're proud. That's not... That's, the, that's a flaw. That's a flaw that, of thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to. But where you are, you have a healthy self-esteem and someone is trying to say you are less than you are. And you say, actually, no. I'm actually this. That is you knowing who you are. That is you, you know, that is you taking a position based on scripture. But the Bible also tells us to be humble. It also teaches us humility. It teaches us, you know, you know, put yourself down and put others up. Not put yourself down in a negative way, but don't, don't compete for, 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 for space with anybody. So understand that as long as your heart position is right, I, I'm less concerned about how I am perceived. I'm more concerned about my heart position. So that, the, I mean, you, you, I could be in the perfect place in my heart, but you could think I'm proud. That might actually be your problem because of your self-esteem. So I can't live my life based on that. I can only try my best, by the grace of God, to be the person that Christ created me to be. So that's how I would address that. Okay, yeah. can I, um, I'll quickly add to it. Um... I think that the issue of self-esteem um, is dicey because, okay, let me put it this way, not dicey really. Um, I think that the problem is what we have learned humility to be. So for a long time, I felt it was, you know, bowing and just put, making yourself small. Interestingly, the, if you do a word study on that as well, it's the actual opposite. What the word humility in the Bible speaks of is taking the position that God has given you without feeling inferior or superior to anybody else. That's humility. Taking your place. So how do you take your place? Number one, find out what God said about you. Jesus had to say, I am, before they could say, thou art. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am this. So when he asked them, say, who do men say that I am? He knew who he was. So when Peter said who he was, he identified it that, oh, flesh and blood did not tell you because that's who I really am. So first of all, find out what does God say about you. Then secondly, speak it back to yourself. This is somebody who I battled with self-esteem for a long time. People don't know. And apart from that, apart from not having any pre-pastor experience, I got married and I felt there was a certain way pastor's wives were to be and I wasn't like that. And people expect it. Because my husband is a people person. He's very friendly. Everybody likes him. And I was very, I don't want people in my space. So I felt a lot of judgment. So what happened for me? What, where did the shift happen? I realized that I live for an audience of one. I had to come to terms with who sent me. Why did he think I was good enough? What did he think about me? Why did he put me in this place at this time? There must be something about me. So instead of listening to what all the other voices are saying, I went back. And every time I would see something, I would write it down. And I would say to myself every day that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am wise. I have wise counsel. And I say it kindly. I am patient. I, I, I said those scriptures to myself until I started to believe them. And it became my reality. And the most important thing, that God is for me. He's in me and he's with me. And he believes in me. So when you say those things to yourself, after a while, you start to believe it. And you know, for before you can get to pride, 
you will first even try and be, let's even have self-esteem. It's far. Pride is far. <laughs> so, I, I think like Pastor Dale said, the truth of matter is that may not be your problem. Maybe how the people see you. Yeah. So as far as you're not using it for anything evil, your healthy self-esteem, then you're fine. Audience of one. I've really learned a lot from these two answers. Have you been blessed tonight? Yeah. Yes. That, that particular question blessed, um, blessed me. And if, like she said, before you get to that angle of pride, if it is rooted in God's word, you will not get there. Yeah. If the word of God is your basis of building your self-esteem, you will not get there. Because the more you see him in worship, the more you, you know, you just, there's nothing to even be prideful about. We're just vessels of his own reflection. So it is the God in me that makes the difference. And in that place of security, I express God. You know, so if you go in with the fear that one day I'll become prideful, that's a snare in itself. May the Lord help us. Amen. Thank you so much, pastors. If you have a question in-house, please signify by raising your hand and I will be coming to you while I wait for that. We have Lizzie asking, address the ability to still be you despite the hurt and scar. This is speaking about the the king still loving Esther in full and not withholding anything even after Vashti angered him. Pastor Mildred, do you want to help us talk about that? I think timing too came into play because he didn't immediately jump from one to Esther was not a rebound. He didn't jump from one relationship into the next. He took the time. It was after some time when he realized four that... Four years, actually. Yes, four, four years. years. Yes, that's true, four years. He, he realized that I, 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 can't, I don't have Vashti anymore. I need someone. And he went through the whole process of picking her. So it wasn't just random. He actually liked her. So you, there was a healing process. And I think that that's what we must all do. If you're in a bad relationship or you've eaten breakfast, just make sure that there's some healing. <laughs> you have received some very hot breakfast. Make sure that there's some healing. You know, you've taken time to heal. Um, my husband says it's heal before you deal. If not, what will happen is that you will punish the next for the sins of your ex. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I don't think we have any more questions. And I think it's been such a powerful night. And it's a great place for us to pray. It's a great place for us to pray, Pastor Jude. And, you know, so many things have been covered tonight, including parenting. And the impacts that parents have on their children by the words that we speak to our children. The importance of being whole. The importance of knowing who you are in Christ. We covered identity, self-esteem, very powerful. And very importantly, our relationship with God. And fellowship coming first before we begin to articulate our own wants and needs and desires. Amen. Take a moment and just reflect on all the Lord and the Holy Spirit have spoken to you to you to your heart to be asking our guests to pray for specific people tonight but i just want you to reflect and maybe just respond quietly to the lord just respond just respond Everyone's got something to receive from heaven tonight. So don't be in the friends, don't be don't be mute. Let's come to our Father in prayer. Right on Holy Spirit. What you doing? We love it. Salam, <laughs> 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 
speaking about you. Amongst our souls And let And that's your response to him That's your response Ride on Holy Spirit, perfect your work, let your word have a full cause. Spirit of God, let healings occur. Let let healings occur. Every bruised self image, every wounded self, I every scar, every scar. So, Lord, let your healing ointment. Let the voice of reassurance. Lebarona la mataziza ya lo para mano se Woman, woman of God, I like you to just say what a prayer for us. Many who's going through some form of some form of a hurt. Some who've been scarred somewhere along the line. That is so hard many times to hear the voice of God above the voices that have said, You're not good enough. Several pompous words have been projected at them. And in their vulnerable moments, the evil one echoes those voices. The Lord has helped you, woman of God, by the same token of God's enabling grace. Can you just speak a word over a word of healing, restoration, as that Holy Spirit leads you? Imrahala do saka brahande kishda Inki alo tu kasam brahana kadushta mandi amranosha Inki alo se preki nando ko se teli amanda kabahado goza Ishta bayan leke manda karobo se te yala kadushta Oh Holy Spirit Father in the name of Jesus We come boldly before you tonight knowing that you are a king and you are a God. But I thank you because you are the God who sees even the deepest parts of our hearts. And you are the God who reaches everyone where they are. Father, I ask, even as you know every single person who is in this place of pain, every single person who is in this place of confusion and turmoil, Lord, I ask, oh God, that your healing power will find expression in their lives in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will heal their soul. You will heal their hearts. You will heal their minds in the name of Jesus. The Bible tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it dwells in our bodies. And if it dwells, you say that it will quicken, meaning that it will bring back to life. Father, I ask that everyone who is feeling dead inside, that your spirit will bring them back to life in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will surround them with the right people, oh God. People who will help them to ease, who will, who will help them to steward this season that they are in so that they will not enter deeper into depression or pain in the name of Jesus. But out of this pain, you will birth something great in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask, oh God, that in this season, that there will be no dullness of hearing, that they will hear you clearly, that they will still see you in this season, oh God, that they will know what you are saying at every season of, the, of life, oh God, so that they will be able to come out of it in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will help them find expression in their relationship with you and that they will, the pain will push them towards you, oh God. It will draw them closer to you, oh God. 
for they will know that only you can they find healing father i thank you because your love oh god will take over and they will find healing in the mighty name of jesus amen thank you heavenly father Hallelujah. in jesus name amen amen and for everyone who's part of this meeting tonight father we come before you the word has come to each and every one of us and one aspect have been exposed to the word that we know we need help is it in our timing lord is it in our tact father is it in our ability to accept love is it in our discernment is it in our patience level lord we open ourselves up to you as we journey on in this week considered in the church as the holy week the week of commemorating the resurrection of jesus lord let growth be seen by reason of the revelation we've obtained tonight amen we worship you father hallelujah in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Can we appreciate God for a beautiful evening? And you want to give a wonderful ovation for our guest, Pastor Mildred Ukoko. I love the fact that you're standing. If you're online, you just want to say, Pastor Mildred, we love you. Thank you for being part of this meeting. God bless you. You may please be seated. Pastor Mildred, I'm going to say this. It's my way of committing you and Pastor Kingsley. So we have started a conversation about a um, singles and married conference sometime in August. She said I should, she said I should work hard to get the date. But I am com they are coming back. Yay! This time, not just one, but the yes. complete pair. <laughs> I thought you'd be happier. <laughs> PK is coming home. <laughs> all right, all right. So you get more information about our singles and married conference in the, in, the, in the coming days i just wanted to tell you about this week and the activities we have for the weekend you know it's easter weekend on friday for us it begins here with a get see many moment sat a uh, friday morning that's good friday 8 a.m what i didn't tell you is that the house of prayer and entire house uh, prayer community will be here at about 7 a.m we just want to begin to the theme of that meeting is it is finished my brother Myro sa will be leading worship pastor Lekon, and, and 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 there's probably just one one more surprise a friend of mine and i were just speaking this morning i said oh you're in town you think you can hide and so there just might be he has not committed so i can't commit him so <laughs> there just might be one one more surprise that the holy spirit will be pulling on us but it's a morning where we, the, the setting here is going to be such that you can be on your face we just want to relieve we're not coming to mourn but we're coming to the cross we're coming to the place where he says if you want to follow me pick up your cross daily daily we are coming to the place of death of the old self and then if christ said it is finished we want to identify with the finished works of christ so it's going to be a prayer meeting, fellowship, and worship. And on Sunday, the big one, Paps is back. Apostle Tony Rappel will be with us for Easter celebration service. I'll leave the rest of that announcement to our moderator for the evening, Pastor Aya. Okay, so, I mean, it's such a packed weekend. Please don't sleep on this. Let's see you bright and early on Friday morning. And please don't come alone, you know, uh, Easter God gave, show the generosity of God. So be generous with your extending your invitation and letting people, as many people as possible, know. Come early on Sunday. We have two services, one at 8 a.m. and the other at 10:30 a.m. For all our diasporians who are watching us, you can also watch on all on all services will be streamed online, TPH Media. But if you're around the corner, please don't uh, you know experience this online. Come live here at the dome for some of the meetings and of course at the Freedom Center. For Sunday service. Thank you all. Pastor Mildred, thank you for coming. Thank you for being a blessing. Um, 
We're really honored to have you. We are looking forward to you and PK being back here. Um, really, really, we are grateful. God bless you. God bless you. It's been awesome. All right, see you next week. Same time for Recharge on Wednesday at 7 p.m. We have a live audience and we have a vibrant online audience as well. So pick your choice. But please see you, um, you know, come here if you can. See you next week at 7 p.m. Same time we continue with Esther. So we live in the hands of one music, um, um, Minister O.K. Chooks, as we worship in recession. My beloved is the most beautiful amongst our souls and ten thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful amongst our souls and ten thousands. For you to be glorified, for you.